Okay. Why that's so loud. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Okay. You All right. So today I kind of came here with a uh, a bit of an agenda to um, I kind of want to convince um, many of you all of you um, who do research or mentor students to um, in, to allow a little more chaos into your lab. And of course, anyone who knows me is probably like, well, that's not surprising that I was talking about that. But I, I, have, a, I have a logical reason for it. I have, there's like, there's data, there's backup data for it and there's some um, important reasons for it. And, and most importantly, it's been successful in my lab. And so um, I'm gonna talk about a lot of the, um, a lot of, um, how my approach to mentoring students in the lab is, um, and that is undergraduate driven research is different, different from undergraduate research experience. And I wanna sort of talk about what those differences are. Um, and not that, not that there's one better than the other, but I just wanna advocate for undergraduate driven because I feel like a lot of um, uh, uh, lab directors or uh, faculty members, it's a little scary letting the students loose in the lab. You just let them play with stuff and push buttons and see if things break or not. <laughs> or if there's, you know, so things go wrong. And that my point is, it's okay that things go wrong. And I have some, some stories to share with you. So the first thing I want you guys to do, um, pull out a piece of paper. No, you can think to yourself. Think of three mistakes you have made, most recent, one that's most recent, one that's the biggest, um, one is the largest impact. I'll give you like, one minute to think about that. Some of you probably have examples sooner than others, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean today? I mean, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Does everybody know people research? No, oh yeah, no, this in general. This in general. I'm trying, I'm gonna try to make a point later this. Uh, there should be some points coming together throughout the, the presentation. Okay, does everybody have some ideas of what their most recent biggest, largest impact mistake has been? Um, and so um, now I want you to kind of think about what did you learn from these mistakes? How did they shape you? And some adjectives that you might use to describe those. I'll give you a minute to kind of think about those things. And then we're gonna make a word cloud, I think. So come up with lots of good words. Like counting down, right? I know, I feel like <laughs> it could be mistakes. Boom. 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 All right, 10 more seconds. I'm going to hold all the stuff in your head because I'm going to try to make a word cloud out of this. Um, like everything I do in the lab, some of the things I'm doing today may or may not work. So we'll see what happens. Um, so let's start with 10 words. Do I have to, screen? yeah, do I have to switch? Yeah. So I just stop the share and then yeah, share the share? You share let's see. Oh, you Where's share. I want to go to this. Yeah. That that was, was, if you do the screen, then yeah, the screen. So I do the screen. So yeah. I go back up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, okay. Somebody confirm on Zoom yes. that they can see. Okay, perfect. Oh yeah. All right. So I'm gonna. Um, so we have the word list. So first, I want to make a shape because I found out that I can make a seagull. Oh. <laughs> well, a bird, and I'm gonna pretend it's a seagull. Um, not a bit a bird. Um, we're gonna pretend that's a seagull, right? That's a seagull. Yeah. And I can make colors. Ooh, that's actually a pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. How about, yeah, how about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now that was very important stuff. <laughs> and now can I close? Apply. Okay. Close. Now I want to ask you for some of those um, words. So adjectives that you hold on, let me get all of these out of here. Adjectives that you guys thought of, or even just share so what the things that you thought of, like what, how did they shape you? I'm gonna to try to add some adjectives, some words in here to sort of populate this word cloud. Um, I'll say 
conscientious. Oh dear, I'm supposed to spell that in front of everybody. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh no. <laughs> Super tall, fragile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I had it. I can't help you. Your my PhD is not. It's gonna be very terribly spelled. Um, okay. Any other words or just even concepts? Resilient. And you know now I'm being watched and I can't even spell cat. Okay. Anything? Bobo. Huh? Bobo. What did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what does it stand for? You're missing out. Oh. Oh wait, I forgot resilience. Okay. This is a this is a fairly new tool in my toolkit. So okay. 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 Yes, that works. Serendipity. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's a weird sound. There you go. So the idea is like I guess panic. I could panic. <laughs> um Explosive. I want to know what mistake you make. Explosive. <laughs> yeah. My mom did once um, blow up our toilet. <laughs> the baking soda I made. But she, she did something. Yeah, something should have gone down. I know. So yeah, my mom does explosive mistakes. Cautious. Oh, cautious. I guess I could have said more. Any other? Um, if I ask you what ways did some of those mistakes shape you, what would you say? Careful. Oh, you're like, oh, I better be more careful. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Patient. Patient. Ooh. As in more patient with yourself, more patient with the work, or maybe more patient with other people who make mistakes? So all of the above. Awesome, perfect answer. <laughs> all right, maybe two more things. I want risk this averse. Huh? Risk averse. Risk averse. One more thing, one more. Slower. Slower, slow down. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to I, mention, know, have to be more I don't know. You, we could have had more things, but all right. So I don't know if this is going to be a really well populated bird, but you know, you get the idea. Um, but I just want to give you sort of this an idea of sort of the kinds of things that we think of. Yeah, it's a pathetic board, you guys. <laughs> um, what kinds of things that we think of when we think of mistakes? Notice a lot of them are um, negative, right? Um, and so I kind of want you to remember that as we go through stuff, because I, I'm going to try to make some points that it's not always negative, right? Um, that, and I was hoping some of you would, maybe you did, um, sort of like, maybe you were shaped by something that was a mistake, maybe it was a big mistake, but it, you, it molded you in a good way, right? It had a good outcome in the end, right? It's not all mistakes do. Um, or maybe it's a good outcome because now you're more patient, right? And you slow down and you focus. Um, so anyway, so I kind of want you to think like not as a negative. Um, that's what my agenda is today. All right, so this is kind of my outline. I'm going to talk about what is undergraduate driven research and then why. And then I want to make a plug for how it plays into diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and then I'm going to give you some um, lab examples of work that um, has come out of my lab that um, was undergraduate driven. So there's other projects that are faculty driven. They're my ideas and the students do them and they do them as a team. But there are other things that are student driven, really hard, pretty fairly student driven. Um, and so I want to share those and little stories behind them um, if there's time. And then um, I'm going to share best practices. But again, best practices, I always think best practices are always like, ideally, in a perfect world, this is what you're supposed to do, right? And I, you know, when I share them, just remember, I'm not doing all those all every semester 100%. But these are what uh, the ideals I, I kind of try to 
lead in my lab um, to encourage undergrad-driven research. Okay, so I have the two columns, undergrad-driven research versus undergrad research. And again, there's not like a better than, right? This is just me trying to kind of sort of, and it's my, <laughs> the opinions up here are mine. <laughs> um, so some of you might are, might disagree with sort of my quick three bullet, bullet point of undergraduate research experience, but this is sort of a quick and dirty sort of difference. Basically, the research topic is driven by the student interest in undergraduate driven research, right? Um, as opposed to a student assigned a research topic. Now, sometimes, you know, uh, a student will come in, so it's not like Dr. Patterson and I, we have a project that stopped and now it's going to start again. Um, but we designed it, we decided, you know, worked on it, we set it up, we got the IRB, and then the students come into the lab and they're interested because they're interested in doing that project or they're interested in that kind of research. And then they, we, they, we give them little assignments on that stuff, right? So it's still perfectly, you know, acceptable way to give students, you know, um, um, research experience. But they're having, but I also do a couple of projects, there's always a couple of projects in my lab where students have like an idea. They're like, oh, I wonder if that, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if we could do that. And then before you know it, I'm like on the edge of my comfort zone, learning something new, right? And they actually take the lead in, in teaching me the new things, right? So it really is sort of this reverse, it's almost a reverse, or maybe it's more of a, you know, equal grounding. Um, and so that takes me to the second bullet point. The faculty member adapts their expertise. So you don't go, you know, I don't become like, I don't know, a professional flute player. You know, I don't change completely my field of expertise. I'm not going to do social, I'm not going to do like social psychology, right? Um, but I can adapt some of my ex expertise to include what the student's knowledge is, what the student's skill set is, and what their interests are. Um, and you'll see that in some of the examples that I give later on. Um, yeah, do you see? So, um, do you see live action footage of Libra? So, I, I joke because you can sit down. I'm like, okay, yeah. So, watch that closely because I love it. It is such a perfect example of like really what happens in, our, in my lab. So, it looks like all hell is breaking loose and cars are gonna, but nobody's getting, everybody's doing okay. And they're just kind of like, there's no stop signs or lights and it's somehow happening. And it, I, and I, I actually use this whenever things have been chaotic and we like, you know, and we're like, what are we doing? And we have a group me um, um, uh, channel and I'll like post that whenever it's like, okay, phew, we got this, right? And, it's, and it is resonates with a lot of people in the lab because it is sort of a control of chaos. And, and so that's where I want to get you to sort of think about, you know, um, releasing some of the chaos control. So pick chaos control meaning you're trying to control the chaos. You're trying to add structure. You want to make sure, and I understand why, and there's times you want to do that, right? Um, when you're submitting an IRB application, you are like, oh, submit whatever and see how it happens, how it goes, right? Or teach yourself EEG and then see how it goes. <laughs> like that's not, you know, there, there's some things that need structure. But I think um, in general, in an undergraduate research experience, you know, the student is provided the structure. The idea is to minimize the um, mistakes, to sort of have, this is how we write papers. This is how we design a project. This is, um, and so we sort of have the bits and pieces uh, laid out for them, right? Um, and it's a very traditional sort of environment. Even it's hands-on experience, it's experience, it's experiential, um, you know, learning, but it is the faculty member. I am the expert, and I'm going to tell you how you know how to do these things. Okay, do those things. Oh, nope, you didn't do it. That okay, fix that. You know, and and so that's fine. But on the control chaos side, um, it's very clear that mistakes are sort of part of the process, um, and the and the students are figuring things out um, on their own, right? Not and they come to me as they need it, and sometimes I'm learning. So sometimes I'm like. Google Scholar, what is going on? Or I'm like, Biopack, how do I attach? Right? So I'm learning things as I'm going. And I want to advocate for how, how empowering that is for students when their faculty mentor is like, oh no, let's look, right? And you're just as sort of clueless as they are. Um, uh, whatever, a little bit, a little bit less group them, but you're still sort of searching for them. There have been times where students have gone out and done a really great in-depth literature review, and they're telling me stuff, right? The content knowledge they're bringing to me. Um, sometimes they're bringing, the, bringing to me the content knowledge and their interpretation of it's a little off, and so we kind of have to adjust that. But um, but I'm learning with them, right? And that takes a little bit of a, it's a little scary. It's like this picture, like, how are we going to look like it through the intersection? 
Um, and we usually do. <laughs> um, but it's a little, it feels a little less controlled. Okay, this is where I get into my activity. Oh, perfect. This is perfect. Okay. I'm going to, uh, we're going to learn how to stack cups. You don't know how to stack cups. Okay. Your is the first one. Okay. This is group two. the scenes of what the heck I'm up to. I'll send you um, the tasks they're having and you can sort of surmise what I'm doing with them. Did you want it open? Yes, she just shared the link. Oh, now it doesn't matter because okay. now the Zoom people, I'm just going to tell. I'm going to tell everybody, okay. so now it doesn't matter. Thanks. <laughs> you guys are to take longer to do this. What I did, oh, actually, what I do want to, uh, sorry. Actually, Chris, can you get it back up? Yeah. Where was it? Oh, okay. I didn't have it open. Yeah, but you want to go ahead. So, what I did to you guys, you had different instructions. So, <laughs> oh dear, did I do that? <laughs> so these are the struct instructions that this group had. 
well, let's talk about that. We'll talk about that. So these instructions that this group had, this group, this group, yeah, you guys had different instructions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is the instructions you guys had. Oh, <laughs> oh no. I'm surprised you guys even got that far. instructions so for zoom people the group two that had these instructions um they took a little bit longer but then they didn't follow instructions so the two faculty members you know didn't follow exactly um so i hope i convinced you that you know constraining and constraining with too much structure can inhibit some of that creativity and so these are just sort of some um thoughts that i have um okay sorry <laughs> Um, that I have about sort of why we need, why students need to get messy. And of course, I have a toddler. She's pre K now. What? Um, so, but I think of this a lot because what are we taught with child development? They're supposed to get messy and play with things. And they're not, and they're not, there's no structure you're supposed to give them. Let them make it. This child is going to learn how to draw and paint eventually, but right now, he's going to figure out what these textures are, what the colors are, right? Um, when Lexi was, got it, we got her a train table. Eventually she was doing all kinds of weird things, but eventually she figured it out, how to put the train, brought the train together, the, the track together, how they link together, and, and how she could make a complete loop, loop so that the train works, right? And so, and then I got some train, he didn't like put the track, and she had like trouble with that. But she learned, right? It, we didn't have to put structure on it. But this example kind of reminds me of my husband, who is obsessed with everything being controlled, and he wants structure. And so every time we get something like this in the house, he tries to he tried to put the train exactly the way he wanted it. I had to like interrupt him and be like, "This is her toy, <laughs> <laughs> and she needs to do it this way. You can't do it for her. Um, you can't intervene because you're going to ruin the fun. You're going to ruin the enjoyment. You're going to ruin the fun." And you're also going to inhibit any creativity or anything she learns. If she puts the things wrong together or the wrong train on the wrong track that doesn't fit, she learns from that. Um, and so um, I think that's sort of the, the, the thing I think about in the lab. Like if I put too much structure and too much direction, 
um, for students and they end up um, not learning or, or they end up learning that they learn how to follow those ridiculous instructions that I set out for group two, right? Um, but did they learn how to sort of figure things out on their own? And this is somewhat related to, um, I don't know if any of you have um, seen this article, it's kind of old. Um, it is, um, how do I get this to go? To go? Yeah. Um, yes, open it, I want to open it. Um, so I'm actually gonna read it. So now we're gonna have a reading. <laughs> um, I, it's short and I love it. There's several phrases in here. So has anyone seen this? It's, it's, it's old, it's come from, it's from 2008. The importance of stupidity in scientific research. I was in grad school at the time, so I was like, yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm supposed to be dumb, this is great. Um, but I like it, it resonates still as um, a faculty mentor. So I'm just gonna read it. I recently saw an old friend for the first time in many years. We had been PhD students at the same time, both studying science, although in different areas. She later dropped out of grad school, went to Harvard Law School, and is now a senior lawyer for a major environmental organization. At some point, the conversation turned to why she had left graduate school. To my utter astonishment, she said it was because it made herself stupid. After a couple of years of feeling stupid every day, she was ready to do something else. I thought of her as one of the brightest people I knew and her subsequent career supports that view. What she said bothered me. I kept thinking about it. Sometimes the next day, sometime the next day it hit me. Science makes me feel stupid too. <laughs> It's just that I've gotten used to it. So used to it, in fact, that I actively seek out new opportunities to feel stupid. I wouldn't know what to do without that feeling. I even think it's supposed to be that way. Let me explain. For almost all of us, one of the reasons that we liked science in high school and college is that we were good at it. That can't be the only reason. Fascination with understanding the physical world and an emotional need to discover new things has to enter into it too. But high school and college science means taking courses and doing well in courses means getting the right answers on tests. If you know those answers, you do well and you feel smart. A PhD in which you have to do a research project is a whole different thing. For me, it was a daunting task. How could I possibly frame the question that would lead to significant discoveries, design and interpret an experiment so that the conclusions were absolutely convincing, foresee difficulties and see ways around them or failing that solve them when they occurred? My PhD project was somewhat interdisciplinary, and for a while, whenever I ran into a problem, I pestered the faculty in my department who were experts in the various disciplines that I needed. I remember the day when Henry Taub, who won the Nobel Prize two years later, told me um, that he didn't know how to solve the problem I was having in his area. I was a third year graduate student, and I figured that Taub knew about a thousand times more than I did, conservative estimates, if he didn't have the answer, nobody did. That's when it hit me. Nobody did. <laughs> That's why it was a research problem. And being my research problem, it was up to me to solve. Once I faced that fact, I solved the problem in a couple of days. So it wasn't really very hard. I just had to try a few things. The crucial lesson was the scope of things I didn't know wasn't merely vast. It was, for all practical purposes, infinite. The, that realization, instead of being discouraging, was liberating. If our ignorance is infinite, the only possible course of action is to muddle through as best as we can. I'd like to suggest that our PhD programs often do students a disservice in two ways. First, I don't think students are made to understand how hard it is to do research and how very, very hard it is to do important research. It's a lot harder than taking even very demanding courses. What makes it difficult is that research is immersion in the unknown. We just don't know what we're doing. We can't be sure whether we're asking the right question or doing the right experiment until we get the answer or the result. Admittedly, science is made harder by competition for grants in space and top journals, but apart from all that, doing significant research is intrinsically hard and changing departmental, institutional, or national policies will not succeed in lessening its intrinsic difficulty. Second, we don't do a good enough job of teaching our students how to be productively stupid. <laughs> that is, if we don't feel stupid, it means we're not really trying. I'm not talking about relative stupidity in which the other students in the class actually read the material, think about it, and ace the exam, whereas you don't. Um, I'm also not talking about bright people who might be working in areas that don't match their talent. Science involves confronting our absolute stupidity. That kind of stupidity is an existential fact inherent in our efforts to push our way into the unknown. 
preliminary and thesis exams have the right idea when the faculty, commit, faculty committee pushes until their student starts getting the answers wrong or gives up and says, I don't know. The point of the exam isn't to see if the student gets all the answers right. If they do, it's the faculty who failed the exam. The point is to identify the student's weaknesses, partly to see where they need to invest some effort, and probably to see whether the student's knowledge fails at a sufficiently high level that they are ready to take on a research project. Productive stupidity means ignorant by choice. Focusing on important questions puts us in the awkward position of being ignorant. One of the beautiful things about science is that it allows us to bumble along, getting it wrong time after time, and feel perfectly fine as long as we learn something each time. No doubt, this can be difficult for students who are accustomed to getting the answers right or that there are ever an right answers, right? That the idea that there are right answers is also kind of not true in our field sometimes. No doubt, reasonable levels of confidence and emotional resilience help, but I think scientific education might do more to ease what is a very big transition from learning what other people once discovered to making your own discoveries. The more comfortable we become with being stupid, the deeper we will wade into the unknown and the more likely we are to make big discoveries. So that, sort of highlights a lot of my um, a lot of my drive, right? Or a lot of um, the logic I use in my class in my in my lab. Um, I'm just gonna point out also, so they need students see things to be messy because um, you know it encourages them to you know be more creative. It they they learn better that way. Um, of course I want to fo focus on while they're being messy. I'm not letting Lexi paint the whole kitchen, right? I'm providing some sort of structure, some sort of limits. So faculty members are still providing models of rigor and excellence, but you're letting them be a little messy. The other thing I wanna point out is there is a science behind it. So in neuroscience and in, in electrophysiology, or, um, there is a, elect, a brain wave, which you measure um, EEG. Um, there is a brain wave when I'm like, Performing a task, there's a brain wave that happens about two to 400 milliseconds after I make a mistake. Um, it's called it, it's called colloquially in our field the oh shit wave, right? Because it's that sensation of like ah. Oh. If you've ever locked your keys in the car mm -hmm. or home or office, it's the ah, oh, right? When you have that moment, you if I had electrodes on you, you would be showing this high peak of uh, called an ERN, event-related negativity. It is higher to things that we, that we get wrong um, than the things that we get right. Um, and subsequent trials after that were slower and more accurate, right? Um, it served a purpose. And also, um, our brains are wired to learn from mistakes, not from getting things right. Um, we are wired to survive, and survival means being aware of change and when we have a template that doesn't match keys are supposed to be here not in my car right then we our brain gives us that signal that hey there's something wrong there's a mistake right so that is something that your your frontal lobes are going to kind of come online a little bit more while you are making a mistake right so it shouldn't always be negative things right we're paying more attention our brain's getting sort of more engaged when we are making these mistakes and of course you know, students who experience this in the lab, they're going to, you know, we can show them this meme. I can be like, hey, you know, we've all seen this. This is what success looks like. People think success looks like. This is what it's really like. But when they experience it, right, this is what people think research is like, right? The hypothesis, this is what I was supposed to do. And then I did the data, and then I analyzed it, and so we found. Uh, but it really was like this, right? And so students get to experience that firsthand, right? That confusing, you know, um, um, muddling part. Um, okay. So. I want to quickly make it to my at least my examples. Um, the other um, plug I want to make is that um, what I've noticed in my lab and what I've noticed in some of the reading I've been doing about um, this type of undergraduate driven research is that it does a couple of things. It allows you to meet students where they are at, right? So when they come in, you're not you're not worried about what skill set students come in with because they're going to learn as they go you can meet them where they are. Some people are, some students are super computer savvy and some are not, right? Some can get into the Excel and like, you know, do stuff in there and some can't. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the unintentional gatekeeping that we do um, comes from, I think a lot of unintentional gatekeeping happens as a result of the culture of academia, 
right? So we have this idea of, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna recruit somebody who has a 3.8 GPA into my lab. I'm gonna recruit somebody who's had all these different, um, these different um, classes, or, you know, they have to prove themselves before they even get to your lab, right? And I'm gonna argue, I've had several students who didn't meet some of these minimum requirements, who didn't see themselves. I've had students tell me that. I, I don't see myself as being a PhD. I don't see myself as being a neuroscientist. I don't see myself as doing this. I keep screwing up. Why? You know, and these students are now, you know, um, research assistants, research assistants at University of Maryland or in a couple PhD programs. So there are, you know, students who didn't see themselves as belonging, and they and this sort of bringing them into that fold, letting them make mistakes, yeah. letting them see me make mistakes, right? Um, I think that reduces the barriers, right? We reduce the barrier and we re if we reduce that hierarchy, I know as faculty, we're kind of worried about reducing the hierarchy a little bit because we're like, I'm the boss and you guys are the students. But if you can get down to the point where you are actually equal on this research journey or more equal on this research journey, I think that that really gives them, that you really are providing a safe space for feeling stupid, right? Um, and that's not just for the research experience. Maybe they're not gonna do a PhD in neuroscience. Maybe they're going to you know, get a job somewhere, right? I mean, life, you have to sort of be okay with being stupid and take chances. So I would just make a plug for how that plays into um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I'll just share these three examples of um, research that was done in my lab um, that way. So I have other projects that are you know, faculty driven, but these are faculty, these are student driven. This was, this is one of the ones, um, I love them all, but this is one of my favorite ones because it was my first student here at Salisbury. Um, I had no clue what I, I was like, I have to set up a lab, I don't know, like what's going on, I'm teaching all these classes and blah, blah, blah. Um, And I also came from a really toxic apartment. So every time people were nice to me here, I was like, what's going on, why are we nice? So I was really like, overwhelmed with what I was doing. And she wanted to do research. And I said, oh, okay, what do you want to work on? She wanted to be a music therapist. I was like, uh, okay, I need to figure out how to set up my, my equipment. She can help me with that. Ah, okay, go do some literature searches, right? Um, it took us about two years to get to something, and then it took two more years for us to get the paper published, but, um, and several cycles of students kind of taking over the project, but um, she really struggled, but she also didn't realize how awesome she was. This is what broke my heart. She is a first generation college student, so she doesn't know, right? She doesn't know what she is good at or not good at. Um, I handed her the keys to the lab. I mean, I really, she really did get let loose in the lab. And she was amazing. If there is a YouTube video that will help you learn something, she found it. Like she found YouTube videos for E-Prime, or the stimulus presentation software, everything in my lab, right? EEG, uh, you know, hardware, software. She was finding, you know, videos on. She couldn't, if I wasn't answering the email right away, then she would like figure it out. Um, and of course our design, we made a couple of mistakes. We had to like go back to the drawing board. Our design was flawed, but I was as a mentor was flawed in supervising it, right? I didn't catch something, but then she, we, but she learned from those, right? And then she got to get practice realizing, oh, that was a mistake we made, not I made, right? That's not a sign that I didn't do well. Um, so I just love this one because, you know, it started out with me just being brave enough to be like, I don't know anything about musical anything, honestly, right? Um, I know about the, you know, we, we use this to, we use the skin conductance uh, equipment. Um, so we, we can measure um, uh, autonomic arousal by measuring the uh, sweat gland activity on the, um, on the fingers. And so I just knew that, right? I knew the method. She went and found, she was teaching me all about music, the music theory. Um, the other one, I know I'm out of time, right? So um, other ones are um, a false memory study that we did. Again, the student was like, I want to do false memory. I'm like, what? That's so hard. Again, I was like, I guess we, he came up with a really creative way to get, you know, I, I, I we talked about what the physiological signal is, um, you know, and he went and took that and he found, you know, a way he came up with some ideas that these were his ideas, right? Um, and so that's awesome. Um, these are two studies that I worked on during my sabbatical. They're actually about to be, oh, well, one was submitted and rejected, so we have to work on that. So the students are learning more about feeling stupid. <laughs> but um, this is, you know, again, I wouldn't have normally done this. Do you guys know the five love languages? Okay, so I'm like, this is like prop psychology. What are you coming to me with this for? And this person wanted to be a marriage um, counselor. And I'm like, I don't know. 
But I was like, if you want to work with me, you've got to do cycle fits. So we've got to find a way to make this cycle fit. And we did, right? Um, and then this is a this happened because a student in one of my Psych 301 classes was like, he pondered a question in one of the um, discussion assignments about dental anxiety, right? And I was like, I don't know, this sounds interesting. What if you do this? And he said, what if you do that? And I was like, what if you could come, in, come into my lab and try it? And that's it. And now we're about to have a publication. We're going to submit that soon to a publication. And he's now a dentist, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's taken a while. So this takes a while, right? Um, but I feel like it's worthwhile. These students really get something from it, right? And you now it's going to talk about timeline and best practices, but really my key point was like to really pound home the idea that embracing chaos and stupidity actually has serves a purpose. Comments for Echo, and then we'll transition into Jen Evans. Okay. No connection to chaos and stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Lawrence. Yeah. 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 On my PowerPoint slides. <laughs> in the world. Uh, if you if you just Google GIF, like if you GIF images and then you Google traffic. She needs GIF. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay, wait. Is it a conversation before? Yeah, have we? Yeah. Oh, whatever. Okay. Yeah, not my phone is available at any places in the world. Oh, where? I don't know. I just grab things from the interwebs. What are you talking about? Anyway, thank you for sharing. I didn't even know that you wrote this. Uh, <laughs> but um, what this leads me to think is that you're getting students at earliest sophomores, probably mostly juniors and seniors. And I was speaking about your thoughts regarding shouldn't we have more chaos in our regular classes just like this? Like they shouldn't come to you like I've only been learning things from books and now I have to think. So I know in like my S and P class, mm -hmm. they used to have a project where I said, you know, I noticed that when I stand up my kayak, it looks taller than I lie down. And I said, do a project, you have three weeks to do it. Tell me whether things people overestimate things that are tall versus flat. Mm -hmm. And they are presenting that this week, and they have no idea how to do it. And they said, I'm not going to tell you anything else. And you had no, no idea how it's going to turn out, right? I mean, and they all have different ways of going yep. out. I mean, the, I mean, so that's it. That kind of connects to what I'm really experiencing this semester with um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion in neuroscience class. I mean, I was like, I don't know how this is going to work. And I was like, let me do this and I'll do that. But I've given them a lot of brain in that class. And it really has made the that space a brave space to share some, you know, pretty sensitive stuff at times. But you know, we they they had a say in the in the syllabus, not everything, but some of it. They had a say in making the ground rules. Um, they're building their office. Like they they had wide range for the final project that they're working on, and I, and they're in, in discussion of new topics, of course, as usual. But I mean, half the time I'm like, what is going on? Is this going to be okay? And um, I feel like they're getting a lot out of it, you know? And I wasn't sure about that, but then on their, their weekly sort of check-ins, you know, I don't know, maybe they just are kind of like, you know, blow smoke up my butt, I don't know. But like, but they, they do seem to genuinely feel safe in that place. And it is a very talkative class. And you guys know these students talk, right, very easily. Um, and so I do feel like, you know, by letting them have a say, student-driven teaching, student-driven classroom, right? Like that's still as a concept too, so. They do feel a lot safer doing something in a small group and speaking to the whole class. Mm -hmm. That's true. So I am a political science and history major, so I do none of that. <laughs> um, so, but like, I'm still focusing on doing research because mm -hmm. in history, you have to have a capstone, you have to have your COSAM, and then in political science, you do relatively the same. How would you, I guess, allow chaos in a setting <laughs> where all you do is basically read books and write yeah you're right um i would let you go at, so i do i it does take a sort of balance so when i have students do the writing and the proposal writing and the literature searches um i kind of let them muddle a little bit Right, so I would let you muddle. I wouldn't give you the keywords. I wouldn't like. I wouldn't give you the structure per se. But I wouldn't let you muddle for five years, right? I would. There's a balance in which I'm like, well, you look a little like overwhelmed with that muddling. Let me like structure this. Um, and I think one of the things I do too is 
consistent check-in so you can see if like the muddling is working or it's you know um, engaging or if it's exhausting the student. So I, there's still things that you can do um, by not restricting and structuring what you're going to write about and how you're going to look for it and how you're going to think about it and interpret what you find. Well, in this class, I don't know yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> Um, so for the um, so the, for the research lab students, they take a psych 490 and you kind of study. Um, and I do have, you know, I, I actually have a great, I have my class set up where they have assignments for various self-paced tutorials. Sometimes they can choose them, choose your adventure. Sometimes I'm like, no, this is your adventure. Um, and so, you know, I grade them on, I don't want to say effort, but I, want, I grade them on sort of their work, not like the, out, the outcome, but the output, I guess. Like, are they making progress? Did they like spend, you know, did they spend time trying to get that program to work even though it didn't get to work? Um, for the final project in the DEI class, I think I'm going to just do something where I have them reflect upon their contributions to the, um, to the final project. I did that. All right. Jen, Ed, Jen. Great. So Stacey and Tim, if you don't mind, be close to the camera we'll on Zoom and hear better. Yeah, no, totally fine. All right, so I'll just see if you can take over there. Yeah, you close that. I'll just make sure we still got the Zoom. And if you want, you yeah. can remove the pen. I think we're good. And I'll get rid of your stuff. So that's who we got. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, while Sandy is logging in, I can just say, like, by way of introduction, that we don't have anything like really super specific to go over. This was sort of we were asked to lead a discussion, and so I'm here on behalf or in my role as, I guess, chair of the first year seminar and experiential learning committee, uh, subcommittee of the general education oversight committee, to use my full title, uh, have not added that to my email signature yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Uh, but yeah, so really, we just wanted an opportunity to help people think about um, uh, how to think about these seminars, what they're going to be. Of course, everything that we're going to say is contingent on faculty senate approval. So it's kind of hard to present on things that aren't fully official yet. So I would kind of encourage people maybe not to think about, hey, what's the official story or what's really gonna happen with this? Cause we don't really know that information. We're more trying to work with faculty and think about how would you design courses to fit into these categories? What are the things that are most exciting to you? What are the things that are most worrying to you? And if we can help in that conversation, we're more than happy to. Yeah, I have the same title, chair of the civic and community engagement subcommittee and then the chair or uh, i don't know what the flc lead is called for um, i went for the most acronyms i could possibly do <laughs> the su uh gen ed pd flc um, so we, we made some suggestions for some possible general education uh, faculty development seminars so you've seen emails um, chris has sent out some jessica clark's office has sent out some about may 24th 25th and 26th Anyone who's interested in first year seminar courses, CCE courses, diversity and inclusion courses, or environmental sustainability courses, that's kind of 12 hours of focused time with people interested in talking about this to kind of get together and talk through um, revisions, content, terminology that might be necessary as part of the process. Again, like Tim said, less about the process itself, first, first complete this, and complete that more about kind of the holistic way that we're thinking about revising courses. Um, the nice thing is they both all three days include lunch and you get $500 mm -hmm. after you complete the seminar. So there's a bonus there too. Yeah. 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 Yeah
you still need people to sign up? What's the deadline? Uh, ostensibly, the deadline is today, I think. Welcome to the inside. Um, anybody who still wants to join, <laughs> can certainly just like email me directly. I mean, there's also there is a, a form to complete um, the first year seminar kind of capped out because we're trying to have some parity. Um, I'll also say that Fulton is really well represented in the first year seminar and in uh, the diversity and inclusion one, which is great. So we're trying to do some outreach to the other units just to see if we can get some parity there. But it's not like we're going to turn people down from Fulton just because we don't get enough from Henson or whatever the case is. So I, it's not really like a formal wait list or anything, but um, we'll do our best to accommodate. We have funding for 60 total participants. Um, ideally, it would be 15 in each of the four areas, but you know, we're not going to force that for any particular reason. Yeah, so um, just really very briefly then as a sort of foretaste of what we're gonna talk about uh, in much greater depth. Um, I had a little handout that I have here. Uh, anyone who's remote, you can access this. This is just the exact same information that was sent out uh, from Faculty Senate. So you just have to look up the, the first year seminar uh, list. But as you can see, there's really uh, some broad program outcomes that are defined. Uh, and so I'll just sort of read those. Uh, so the, the first program outcome that we identified was achieve the student learning, learning outcomes, right? So that's a uh, nice, nice clean start there. I, but also I do think with experiential learning and first year seminar and, and you know, I think it's true of the tagged areas as well. We've talked a lot about student learning outcomes and those are really important. They do drive all of the assessment. They drive the way that they're gonna be evaluated and it's important that we have those as a common language across campus. But then also we have to design these intentionally as programs as well. They have to be meaningful programs. They have to intersect with our disciplines, with our majors. They have to intersect, you know, hopefully they're gonna create connective tissue across campus. Is really one of the ideals um, that we're looking for. So we, we are designing a kind of program. So we, um, we articulated those outcomes as well. So we're trying to have students become familiar with the wide range of academic and community resources available on campus, uh, become aware of the value of academic knowledge, methodology, expertise, specialization, and disciplines, um, demonstrate preparedness for academic work and life, gain awareness of a range of topic, academic fields of study, and areas of professionalization, display clear understanding of sources of knowledge and their uses, engage with problems of consequence through the critical analysis of materials, and then prepare for future academic challenges. Um, so I'm just going to highlight kind of three big buckets that we want to accomplish with those outcomes. One of them is, is that we really want uh, SU students' first experience on campus to be the deep exploration of a topic. And um, uh, those don't have to be interdisciplinary. They don't have to be disciplinary. Some people use the language of pre-disciplinary. But the idea is that the topic is front and center, and it's a little bit like the kind of the messiness that Echo was talking about, where we know that there's a big issue, you know, and then it's up to the faculty to determine and set the agenda for what those topics really should be. Um, we have talked about how it's helpful to think through, if you are thinking across disciplines, you can think of um, the three legs of the stool, right? You can kind of think of how a topic naturally sits into groupings of several disciplines, right? It should be more than two, Three is kind of a manageable amount if you think you shouldn't be doing 12 disciplines, right? you shouldn't be doing a discipline a week, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, so it should be sort of a topic that dictates what disciplinary resources are necessary. Um, and then also, you know, there's no, there's no specific interdisciplinary requirement. We're just trying to get people kind of excited. I use myself as an example because I have taught an introduction to philosophy class, uh, which I have retired as, a, as an intro, but I'm going to bring back as a first year seminar which is my uh, graphing experiences class. And it's basically philosophy in the graphic novel, looks at graphic memoirs and then pairs graphic memoirs with philosophy articles that are explicitly referenced in the graphic novel. So there's a natural kind of three legs of this duel between art, literature and philosophy that happens in that topic. You're gonna to talk about how do we visually represent our experiences as a mode of philosophical reflection. Um, so anyway, the, the design can come from the topic. There can just be a topic you really wanna talk about. Um, the 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 it can be from a specific grouping of disciplines or really a way of approaching your own discipline that you think is going to be a really great introduction uh, to our students and then the other thing we want people to think about is that we want people to intentionally think of themselves as really the first faculty advisor that a student is going to meet and so 
Um, it's a helpful exercise if you're thinking about a first year seminar to think about like one question that's on the eventual form that's gonna come out is what courses naturally follow from this course design that already exists in SU curriculum? So you could say, you know, very easily I could say, well, one great class you could take after you take my graphic novels class is you could go take a design class from the art department, right? You could also go and take this uh, philosophy class, philosophy of the arts, right? You could also do that. But the idea is that these freshman seminars are points of contact that allow for targeted advising where you say, look, if you like this, you should go in this direction. If you don't like this, you should not go in that direction, right? But if, because we have this kind of what's called a, a, a hybrid model of advising, where some of it is distributed across programs and faculty advisors, some of it is centralized in the advising center, the handoff between those two sides isn't always uh, super smooth. Sometimes it's contingent on declaring the correct major at the correct time. And so first year seminars are a great opportunity for faculty to really play the role of a first advisor for students. And I speak to this uh, largely inspired by my own experience uh, at DePaul University, where I took an art history class that was about Chicago museums. It was very much a first year seminar. And I would never took another art history class again. Uh, and I still, even when I graduated, I would go back to the office of that professor and would just ask them general advising questions. I would sort of get their thoughts on this class versus that class. Um, sometimes they could help me, sometimes they couldn't. But the point was, is it was a person who I immediately felt I could trust and who gave me um, good advice and was just a face uh, that I could that I could approach. So all of those different roles are kind of wrapped up in our vision of the program. Uh, we'll shout out to the subcommittee itself because I have a great team. We've all been working really hard on this. So that's that. So when Tim and I were talking about this, we were talking about the distinction between FYS and the civic and community engagement component. Um, do this for the Zoom folks as well. So we came up with a civic and community engagement tag. We only have one SLO to work with, so it's pretty straightforward. But we did a, a similar sort of thing, kind of big picture grounding. Um, and the, the main difference that we have is the CCE tag is something that's effectively existed at SU for a number of years now. When we applied for the Carnegie Foundation uh, engaged camp, community engaged campus classification, one of the criteria was we needed to have some sort of a tagging system. Is it operational? Not very well, but it exists and it's based on the on the core concept of reciprocity. So if anyone is uh, interested and goes through and kind of like reads this, they will find a lot of information um, about reciprocity in here. Um, and it's reciprocity with someone or some group in the community. Um, so as an example, one of the classes that I've taken on teaching is an introductory education class, School in a Diverse Society. Historically, that class involved 20 to 30 hours of kind of extractive observation. Student would be placed in a school, take notes, come back to class, talk about them, write papers, things like that. Um, the main revision that I've made, and if, um, I'll just keep hitting on the messiness process, um, they're, they're now um, sent to the Newton Street Community Center where they are instructed in like, how are you gonna be an asset? So what are we gonna do here to find out what you can do to be a benefit here? Um, we've got some other programs that do a really good job of this as well. Needs assessments can happen. It could just be staffing tables or providing mentorship or counseling to students. Um, it could just be like we have um, PE majors who come through this class. They love running games with the kids in the park across, from the, across the street. So they're actually providing some sort of resource. They have to articulate why that's um, a beneficial um, thing for them to be doing at the Newton Street Center. They also have to talk about how it instructs them and gives them perspective on forms of education, either formal or informal, and then what they're kind of like learning out of that and things that they might carry forward. So there's a benefit to the student. They have a site in which to see these things actually play out, where we can talk about the ways that communities interact with education in spaces, school or otherwise. And then the Newton Street Community Center gets the benefit of 22-ish students each providing 30 hours of service with the support of a faculty mentor who's kind of there with them in the space or overseeing some of their um, time there. So there's kind of like this tangible benefit um, to have there. So our focus then on learning outcomes and course integration is less about introducing a discipline um, because this could happen at an introductory level, um, at kind of like a mid-career level, or as part of a capstone project. It's more about taking the, the disciplinary content and applying it in a way that is reciprocal with uh, the community partner. Community partner is a broad term. Shane Hall does a great job of this, working with like public comment periods on policies that are available in like federal registries. 
that's a fine example of this because there's still some benefit there. Students are taking uh, meaningful action. So we're trying to be kind of broad with that viewpoint, um, but also recognizing that we do have kind of some clear expectations that have preceded this gen ed creation um, and the SLO itself in terms of targeted outcomes for folks. Um, but just, just like FYS, we've got kind of like a, a step-by-step -step rubric that we'll be looking through to kind of like guide faculty who are interested in developing um, classes for this. And I think we're, we're trying to dance around getting into the weeds because I don't know if this is what the final product's gonna look like. Um, this, these are the sorts of suggestions that have come through from the subcommittees um, about this. There's gonna be three, ultimately three rubrics. You have to show that you have information in each of the kind of areas that we're looking for and then it's approved if not you're getting feedback yeah. from the subcommittee. I, I would also so, say just to not um just to be perfectly clear there's no reason to think that these won't be approved as they are it's probably yeah. you know they're most of what they're doing as I understand it, is they're harmonizing it just to make sure that every one of the subcommittees is producing a way of evaluating things that are consistent with the others so it's it's I don't want to say that this is the final version, but also it's this is probably pretty much the final version. Yeah. Um, we're also very interested in hearing from other people. So anyone who wants to contact me or Sandy to sort of with questions or thoughts or feedback on process, things that would be helpful, we're happy to be resources. Yeah. Um, everyone on the committee, in my experience, is working very much in good faith and um, is bringing you know, just my own committee has, you know, 60 or 70 years of teaching experience on it. Just, you know, it's, it's people, people are really, really taking it seriously and really trying to thoughtfully design a program that's going to be both flexible, but also um, have some consistency and have some real, um, some value. Any thoughts, questions? What a small group, anyone on Zoom, if you want to unmute, you probably can hear you. This is what's on the screen now is just the schedule for the, the May events, if anyone's interested in seeing that. So I'll just go ahead and ask a question that might be more simple and maybe one I kind of would like to, I don't know how you can see, but I have this dream <laughs> of um, creating a class that's data science or social justice. Where do you, because I could see it as a first year um, seminar, or I could see it as a, because I, I think of one of the components is you would have some reciprocity, you would apply your data, the data analysis that you still learn. Right. Um, I just don't know, I'm trying to figure out how that, it's, it's, it's not clear, or <laughs> so, it's very messy. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the interesting things about the new program, the new Gen Ed program, seems to be that you would be able to submit it for lots of different areas yep. and then the class, yes right? and That's so maybe the students who are enrolled in the class might not be able to use it for all of those areas mm -hmm. but they could use it for a first year experience and their dni and then they don't yeah. need to take a separate dni or they could choose to use it for just the cce component if they've got mm -hmm. other classes that are doing that mm -hmm. it's going to be i don't know one of the things that Tim and I we're talking about is we haven't heard or been able to kind of, at least I have not heard a, a visualization of what the tracking mechanism for this is gonna look like. We're all so used to checklists that it's just, this fits one area and done, yeah. but this is gonna be different because different classes can fit into different areas depending on which students are taking it, what program they're coming from, what kind of credit they might need. So I think you're probably on the right track to say, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe okay. it's this, and probably put it forward as all of them, yeah. Yeah. Like, like whatever you think would be the best yeah. fit. For the, for, the, for the distributional piece, you probably have to, as a practical matter, choose. So here's the, here's the <laughs> real. So, because, so there's essentially a, 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 the structure of it still uh, disciplinary in nature, right? Math yeah. be social science and science of math. And so there is some um, play potentially if you have a course in social sciences that could go into one or the other category, similarly with the humanities. So I kind of want, and I, I gather this is being discussed because yeah. as a practical matter, I would think you have to choose 
or you can have students lined up down the hallway saying, I want this account for both of my requirements or whatever. Right. So at some point, you're going to have to choose a category. But except with the diversity, equity, inclusion, the environmental uh, understanding, awareness, whatever we're calling that, yeah, sustainability, those, those float. Yeah. So you can meet the distribution well, requirement. To enforce that. Right. So I've, I've heard that version. <laughs> okay. Articulated, I've, I've articulate you. That was a perfect articulation of one version that I heard. Correct. Yeah, uh, correct. Uh, the other version is that all of them really are just tags, like in, in terms of the way the system is built or is going to be built. So, in principle, it would be possible to submit like a course for everything, right? Now, the idea that you would have any course design that would be able to satisfy every area is, is completely course. bizarre, right? Yeah. So I think what's going to happen is that there, there are going to be both natural aggregations of departments around certain areas, right? And then keep in mind that experiential learning and first year seminar are both designed to be new opportunities for people to sort of showcase their programs in different ways. And so, they're, you know, like, really anyone could have an experiential learning or first year seminar provided that it's designed to fit the program. Um, you still will have the distributional requirements of additional coursework outside the major, things like that, the Comar requirements. That's right. But those, it feels like one of the, so the second kind of out, second way that Tim's talking about would move away from those distributional requirements being the way that everyone thinks about gen ed and instead have the tagging of student outcomes in the courses be the way that we think about gen ed right so instead of the because right now everything's aligned by department you have to take a, a course from these sorts of departments and take this course from these sorts of departments or these departments that are specifically listed as opposed to that it could be just for meeting gen ed requirements you have to take courses that meet these outcomes and it's so there there may be some unintended consequences i'm sure i mean the thing that i try to keep reminding everyone is that Again, staying true to Echo, setting the stage perfectly for this conversation. We are going to have, you know, there are going to be cases that are melon scratchers. There's going to be things that we have to decide policies for. Uh, and so as we go forward with it, we're going to have to figure these things out really on a course by course basis. But um, the, it, there are some really good advantages. And I think the clearest way to see it is seeing it within those, cat, like the humanities category, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's going to be some classes that are clearly one and some classes that are clearly another. And then there's going to be some classes that really could be either. Mm -hmm. And so that gives students the flexibility to sort of, you know, take, take one class for, and, and, and then they, they need a second, but they can take a wider list of options for that second course because some of them could count for either, right? And it's important to remember too, and I know everybody knows this, but the individual students still have to have these distributional requirements. The yeah. individual students have to take things from across campus. Um, I guess I'm just thinking that from a student perspective that the, the, the UX here is really important. Yeah. Uh, and that you will need to be able to uh, represent this gen ed program to the students as, as a coherent gen ed program. And infinite permutations are kind of, <laughs> kind of overwhelming and confusing. And they actually, I, I think, forego an opportunity to at least for once in their lives show them how we have for good or ill right, um, uh, uh, broken down the, the acquisition and development of, of knowledge across academic disciplines. Yeah. And if we lose sight of what those disciplines are, I don't think we're doing our students any favors. No, and we're, we're, I mean, certainly the conversations we've had on the first year seminar experiential learning subcommittee, uh, it has everything to do with, with giving faculty space to speak from their disciplines, about their disciplines, yep. right? And that's the CCE approach too. This is about your discipline. It's not about doing this activity or doing this assignment. It's it's effectively, Sarah and I call it disciplinary citizenship. What is the what is the relationship between your discipline and the way that people in our community understand and try to improve their world? And then how can you use that? So it is it is absolutely disciplinary based for the development of the class, right? And for like the meeting of the criteria. But again, that's like the faculty kind of input into the course design. Which I think is different than what you're talking about, which is that the student understanding of where this fits in their course of study. Yeah. And I think it's also, we take a very similar approach from first year seminar. It's just that we have really moved from the idea of the integrity of the disciplines with each other and thinking of these seminars as part of that connective tissue. So it's that, you know, our, the organizing principle that we're encouraging is to think about 
rather than the role your discipline plays for the broader public? What about the role that your discipline plays with natural connections to other disciplines? What are the sorts of questions your discipline can answer well? What are the sorts of disciplines that your, your discipline relies on, right? If you, if you think about the relationship between philosophy and psychology, sometimes we rely on each other to answer questions because the psychologists will move into a non-observable kind of question. And it's like, well, we, we need to speculate about what's happening here, right? And then the philosophers who are good at doing that responsibly can step in and help out, right? So that's the kind of thing we're thinking of. So as a plug, what the FLC was ultimately pitching was not this three-day thing in May. This is kind of a necessary, let's get started. People are, are interested in developing courses right now kind of thing. What we're actually trying to pitch and what we're really hoping that we can get the faculty development committee, the provost's office and the whatever Jessica Clark's office is formally called um, behind is what Tim's talking about, which is more consistent spaces for these conversations to happen. So that you can actually get faculty from different disciplines, different departments into the room and for FYS, be able to like, quite literally talk with one another, sure, each other in a focused manner about their classes and about their questions, things like that. For CCE to be able to do that, for DNI to get cross-pollination, especially in those kind of floating areas outside of the more traditional COMAR areas that are gonna be certainly more disciplinary, more set in a disciplinary manner. So our, our, my real hope is that this is gonna be followed up by a similar sort of version with a different kind of agenda, hopefully in August, instead of that Wednesday before thing that happens, um, having kind of a longer period for that, maybe even some seminars that run over the course of the semester, because those are the kinds of conversations that are really important and could be really meaningful in helping students kind of connect the dots. But if we don't have opportunities for those conversations to happen, uh, skeptical about how well that's going to be done. It would be a great graphic design exercise. I agree. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Explain Janet graphically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I think, we all, need a, we all need an app. We were, we were just having this conversation in the, in the enrollment meeting that we had the other day, right? Where it's, you know, uh, Mike Scott, as an example, did a deep dive study in terms of when people come in with a biology degree, where do they go if they don't finish with a biology degree? It turns out it's about 20% of bio majors that go somewhere else on campus or somewhere else in the system. And so if we're thinking about advising as a crucial part of retention, our ability to communicate with each other about our disciplines is the key tool that we have to retain students because it should be viewed as a win if I have someone who comes into my class, and trust me, this is not infrequent, that they say, I don't want to do any more philosophy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I will say, I understand. Uh, I, I suffer with it myself. So I, I understand what a labor of love it can be. But uh, I should be able to have good answers or at least good places to turn to say, well, what did you like in the class? What didn't you like in the class? What's the kind of activity you see yourself? What's the job you see yourself ending up in, right? Uh, and, and in that way, it shouldn't really matter if you're losing a certain percentage of people from your program, so long as those people are also finding a home for themselves at SU in all of the very different programs we have. And I just think that one of the legacy and cultural disadvantages that the old system had was that it just encouraged a lot of stovepiping of advising energy around programs. And so we don't, we haven't needed to know about each other's programs. We haven't needed to know about our research specializations. And that's an advising weakness, because I want to be able to, I mean, one of, the common, Even, one of the common complaints I get is that from students in different, all sorts of disciplines is that they don't have enough space for electives and to kind of branch out and, and try different things. So a lot of them wouldn't know, right? If, right. They, if they leave one discipline, they kind of haven't gotten enough. Because a bio 101 lab probably isn't like the thing that's going to hook in their interest necessarily, because it's, it's just not the hands-on stuff that like Echo that you were talking about that can yeah. really capture their, their, um, their passion for it. So I think there's a lot of benefit. Hopefully, hopefully, if done well, if done well, right? And we, it should, it does need to be at that level where you can show the specific relationships, right? And you should be able to eventually look at all of these freshman seminars and say, well, look, look at this distribution, right? These are the these are the seeds of future programs, the seeds of future majors. These are the places you can go. Um, but we're not there yet. You know, we're still we're just really getting consensus on. What are going to be the ground rules on how we proceed? And uh, it is coming quick, though. It's coming quick. 
Did um, there a school somewhere near Lake Erie where they actually make what you choose, you know, to go off center with, with a minor? You have to kind of curate an undergraduate experience and right. sort of put weird things together. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of wondering about the freshman seminar. You know, it, would, it would be that outcome, I think, if that were to devolve into this is the intro course for a major, right? Yes. I mean, obviously, there's the allure of it as a, as a recruiting, but it really should be just, you know, digging into a really cool topic yeah. and playing. Yeah. Yeah. And much more open and very much seminar focused, discussion focused, yeah. right? Focus on working together, doing shared work. Yeah. But I mean, also, the outcomes are, you know, the outcomes work well with some of our uh, more traditional offerings. So if you think about, Okay. It's effective reading, it's oral communication, it's writing, intellectual curiosity is one of the unique ones, critical thinking. Um, so a good seminar on I mean, certainly almost any humanities yeah. system is, is going to cover those things pretty naturally. But, um, but I think I've been, we've been experimenting with this language of the three legs of the stool because it always, the more examples we talk about when we come across examples that we really like, it seems like it's not that you have to be the master of three disciplines, but you should really understand specific disciplinary relationships between these areas and to, and to again, focus on the connective tissue of knowledge rather than perhaps the, the architecture, the bones, as it were, if that's an apt analogy. Okay, so tell me if I'm on the right track for this possible course. Yeah. Something called artificial intelligence for poets. In which well, my view is that everyone in the liberal arts needs to know a hell of a lot about artificial intelligence, because it's going to be everywhere as part of their lives. It is everywhere. Yeah. They avoid it like say. Yeah. But the overall kind of focus of the course is what would it take to program a computer, robot, whatever, to write home? Right. So in that way, you have to focus on the, next, the nature of language, comprehension, um, knowledge. Yeah. Psychologies and stuff, I guess, blocks be built in there. Yeah. So, and you could do a lot of cool. I mean, there's so many sort of free widgets that are out there in terms of, I mean, I've been, you could do, there's actually a, one that just came out that's great that will strip off the vocal track of any sort of pop song. I mean, it's just, it's really very, it's a neural web kind of thing. And it just, it, it's uncanny how well it removes just the vocal track. But, it, you know, just thinking of like, where is the intersection there? Between the arts and artificial intelligence, and also what we consider the human versus the technological or the artifice or the tool, all of those are yeah. That that's exactly the kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And then all I, Sandy mentioned this, but it's worth really emphasizing the the process on all of the committees is being designed so that there is no such thing as a no, yeah. right? The, the it's all either yes or feedback. <laughs> so it's you know it's sort of like. If it's not there yet, so I pushed. I pushed really hard, Jen Nyland, and I pushed really hard for everyone to conceive of this as an, as an editorial board. Um, and oddly enough, we ended up with a whole bunch of committees instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the whole, yeah, the whole idea is accept or R and R. Nobody's going to get an outright rejection. Everything's coming with feedback. It so would, there's no yeah. like it's all for ours at least. It's all single column rubrics. There's no you don't have to hit a 15 out of 17 in order to pass mm -hmm. or anything like that. And everything was narrative feedback. So there's general comments under each of these rubrics. Um, and that was a really deliberate decision to do it this way because we want, even people who have a good course design, we still wanna be able to provide suggestions or like, hey, you should think about linking up with this sort of program or something like that. So what, what is nice about it, I think we're turning this point, this is like submit your course and you're gonna get feedback of what you could do to not make it a better course, but make it a course that better fits mm -hmm. these areas because that is, again is we're, we're not the Comar areas will be different they will talk about how do you make this a better history class or how do you make it a better science class or whatever but these are kind of less discipline oriented i don't want to say they're free of the discipline mm -hmm. um, but the the focus that we're looking at is not are you doing this like a political scientist that's not the goal it would be you're a psychologist you're putting this forward are you applying the ideas of civic and community engagement to psychology. Like, can we see that connection? So you're not, you're gonna get feedback on how to better align with the SLO, as opposed to just what the curriculum review process is now, which is right. so often just like, did you check this box? Did you check this box? 
hopefully this is going to be more more, more, yeah. more beneficial. Right, and so we've had experiences with the feedback. I'm guessing, like, yeah. Wow, I totally would have given you that information if I if I knew. <laughs> right, yeah. We are also, we're self-consciously in, engaging the cyclical nature of the process as well, where, you know, some people have said to me, well, I want like, you know, I think my faculty or people in my area, like they want to do it this way. Uh, is that going to be allowed? And I, my answer is always submit a course, submit yes. your best version of a course that would work really well. We will talk about that course. And then the feedback you get on that will answer your question about whether that kind of thing is allowed. Right. Yeah. It's not really like that. It's not like we're trying to say this works and that doesn't work. The, the faculty themselves will be submitting all of these courses to us and we'll be reviewing all of these courses. And my my hope and my expectation is that they're going to aggregate around like there's going to be this percentage that are just super clearly wow that's what we want these things to be there's going to be a small percentage probably that's like ah, i don't know <laughs> it doesn't seem to really make sense to me uh and then in the middle there's going to be like you know we're trying to push people more towards the one side of the equation than the other but i'm expecting to not really know what the faculty is going to produce i'm expecting to be surprised by like, i never would have thought of that idea right so as we get more submissions we're going to be more able to answer these questions in a very specific way um, um, but we're at a stage in the process where i don't want to prejudge that right like in a sense we're waiting to hear from the faculty to see all these great ideas and then we're going to have you know clearer examples we're going to really be able to have showcase courses where we say look at this yeah um, so tim and michelle did a great job but four or five years ago, putting together some sample FYS syllabi, like what this might look like. And when our FLC took our suggestions to Jessica and to Karen, one of the things that we requested is that Jessica start thinking about how we can curate kind of a library of successful classes. So here are examples. And it, obviously it will take time to build those up from different disciplines. CCE is gonna be kind of unique because Sarah and I have been running this SEAC program for a while. And so we have samples. That we can put up from, um, I don't know, 16 departments on campus or something like that. So there's going to be a wide range that people can look at. It's going to take a while to build that in first year seminar or in DNI or in environmental sustainability to break out of like ENVR um, for them. But that that's part of the hope here is again to create useful supports, not just administrative supports for how do you submit the documents, right? But like <laughs> conceptual supports for how are people articulating these assignments and combining them into classes that make sense and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Another thing that, again, there's the big interdisciplinary question that's sort of hanging there in terms of team teaching or different things like that. Um, one thing to think about is that as you get courses in these categories, you can also think about um, a la cognitive science really sort of forming deeper collaborations in that you can yeah. you can intentionally offer a course that you know is going to pair well with this other course and then you just either teach them alternate semesters or something like that and so you can have a gen ed program where people are actually uh, you know i've been looking at models um the one i shared with chris actually from doane doan university in nebraska but they actually have courses that you can take where um there's a psychology class on fear and emotions and emotive responses from a kind of behavioral point of view. And then there's a political science class about the use of fear in political media. And you just take both of those classes side by side. You can take them in either order because they're, they're not meant to be tracked or sequential. But the idea is, is that from an advising perspective, you're sort of curating areas. If someone is interested in this kind of topic, they're like, well, look, let's, yeah, yeah you want to talk about this, fear? Well, let's, we have to talk about psychology. You have to talk about politics. You have to talk about media. And so then again, you get these natural kind of three legs of the stool approaches where it's like, that's somebody who it would be of interest to a future journalist, it would be of interest to a future politician or policy worker, it would be of interest to a future research psychologist. But the topic is this natural aggregation of different disciplines having research questions and things they can contribute. I have to go around to log on to a yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.